In this lecture, we will prove something called a strong converse for source coding. So what are these strong converse, res uh, converse results? Till now, when we look at asymptotic versions of our results, such as the one that you can see in your screen uh, uh, just here, this is a result from the previous lecture. We allow this epsilon, the accuracy, the probability of error or accuracy in this particular case to go to zero. And in this limit, the bounds match. But a very remarkable fact for many of these results is that, in fact, this result would match for every epsilon. Okay, And when that happens, the lower bound uh, is called a strong converse. So let me elaborate. Let's recall our source coding problem. We had defined this simple version of source coding problem as uh, we had defined this quantity L epsilon Remember, this was the minimum cardinality of a large probability set. So, minimum cardinality of a set A such that under P the probability of, oh, sorry, minimum number of bits, cardinality number of bits. So, minimum number of bits used to store A such that probability of A exceeds 1 minus epsilon. Okay, this is my L epsilon P. And this P here is the same as this P. That's the only way P enters this. All right, and then we define this asymptotic quantity um, for uh, Shannon source coding theorem. We define this quantity limit n going to infinity 1 by n L epsilon Pn, where Pn denotes the distribution of n iid copies generated from P or an n length iid sequence x1 to xn, uh, where the common distribution is P. And this quantity we define. Uh, but we didn't just look at this quantity, we also allow for vanishing error and we looked at this quantity R star P, the asymptotic minimum number of bits required per symbol to, um, to express a sequence x1 to xn. Now instead of this, we could have proceeded as follows. We could have defined, oh, sorry, I missed something here. This is n going to infinity. We could have defined r star epsilon p as this limit. Okay, so this is for a given accuracy epsilon, what is the asymptotic number of bits required per source symbol? That can be defined. In fact, if you go back and look at our scheme, what we showed was that 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 there is a scheme which makes this HP for every epsilon, for every epsilon, okay. So this we already have. So this upper bound on this we already had. However, it's not clear if this bound is tight for every epsilon. Perhaps we can do much better when epsilon is large. So suppose you allow 0.99 probability of error. Can you do much better? That's a very interesting question. And if you see this R star epsilon P is equal to limit as epsilon goes to zero of R star epsilon P. Note that as epsilon for larger epsilon, R star epsilon is smaller. Uh, so this as epsilon increases, this function decreases. This is a decreasing function of epsilon. So in the limit as epsilon goes to zero, this is actually the same as the maximum or the supremum, so-called supremum, supremum over epsilon. It's not max, unfortunately. It's only in the limit. So that that sort of max. It's it's called supremum. Okay. So this is what it is. And uh, what we showed for lower bound was that this quantity here, this quantity here, is greater than h of p. So the question is, what happens for a fixed epsilon? So the supremum, the max guy is greater than HOP, but what happens for a fixed epsilon? And a strong converse result would say that, in fact, this guy R star P is equal to HP for all epsilon. And in fact, strong converse holds for source coding theorem. So that's, that's a remarkable fact. Uh, first shown by Wolfowitz, strong converse for Shannon's source coding theorem it's 
says that for every epsilon between 0 and 1 r star epsilon p is equal to h of p okay so doesn't matter doesn't matter how much accuracy you are looking for asymptotically you will just see this h of p another way to read this thing is that of course this l star epsilon pn depends on epsilon but the dependence on epsilon is of the lower order the leading asymptotic term is hp okay in fact uh, from the calculation that we have done you can even identify the second order term if you are a little bit careful uh, it, it will take some effort to get the correct dependence on epsilon you need to use something like central limit theorem or if you want to be uh, more hands-on you can use a Chernoff bound and directly derive that bound uh, nonetheless the first order term is hp okay so we have already shown we have already shown that this is less than equal to hp so already seen go back to the uh, to the proof of this theorem with limit epsilon going to zero and check our upper bound actually the scheme that we came up with was not depending on epsilon so this is true for every epsilon And what this result is saying is that the lower bound also holds. So how do we show this lower bound? Uh, this proving this uh, strong converse is for source coding theorem and generally uh, so such results. Such results are actually called uh, called uh, coding theorems or information theory. So proving strong converse for coding theorems is a technical topic, uh, but has received a lot of attention. And it is uh, very interesting because it says that allowing smaller accuracy or larger accuracy uh, doesn't change the asymptotic leading term so much so you can just work with reasonable accuracy and look for uh, the answer there and if you want higher accuracy it doesn't mean that you will have great gains in problems like this okay but i would still not think of this as a very practical theorem it's still of theoretical interest and it's uh, sort of a surprising use it, it is a it was a surprising fact when it was first discovered now, in the recent years, there is a rich theory around this phenomenon, uh, this strong converse phenomenon. Uh, it's related to several other things which are well known in probability. Uh, for instance, it is related to the threshold effect, uh, which is there in statistical physics, where you, where you see that uh, a random variable behaves in a particular way when you are smaller than something, and it behaves in a very different way when you are above something. Okay, so, 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 so one more implication of this result, just to connect it to this threshold phenomenon, is that if you have, if you represent a source, an IID source P1 to Pn, using number of bits less than HP, then the probability of error will go to one. Okay, and if you rep because because for any epsilon between 0 and 1 it would have been exactly equal to HP so if you use less than HP bits the probability of error will go to 1 and if you use more than HP bits asymptotically the probability of error will go to 0 so there is this very sharp threshold in probability of error around HP if you use number of bits less than HP the probability of error goes to 1 if you use number of bits greater than HP the probability of error goes to 0 such sharp threshold phenomena are now uh, now known in a variety of situations in random graphs people have seen this uh, in other topics as well okay all right so how how do we show this lower bound i'll give you two different proofs of this strong converse lower bound uh, the first proof is sort of a more classic one so what is this proof okay this proof is very similar to our uh, the proof of our upper bound so what is our upper bound what was our upper bound saying so our upper bound was saying that uh, we have this set x and inside x we are looking for a large probability set a of the smallest cardinality possible and what we said was this is quick review of upper bound proof review of upper bound because we'll build on it for the lower bound proof so we had this large probability set a so p of a is greater than 1 minus epsilon 
Uh, we had to construct a large probability set A with smallest cardinality. So what we said was let's look at all those elements x for which minus log px is smaller than some quantity lambda. Okay, and the idea is that this I'll call this set A lambda. The idea is that the cardinality of this set A lambda, because each probability is greater than 2 to the power minus lambda. So the log of cardinality of this is less than or equal to lambda. Okay. So if you look for this P A lambda, if you look for a lambda such that this has large probability, then you will have lambda as an upper bound on on the on the size of the set. So this implies can find a set of size lambda and a good choice of lambda was a large probability of a bound on this which by chevy chevy inequality was hp plus square root variance of something by epsilon okay okay this was the idea for our upper bound proof our lower bound proof is also of similar style okay so now you are given a large probability set a it is given to you Maybe I use a different color now. So this uh, x is there and you are given this large probability set A such that P of A is greater than 1 minus epsilon. And we want to claim that any such set A must have certain cardinality. Cardinality greater than 2 to the power roughly HP. That's, that's a proof of a lower bound. Okay. How do we show that? So to show this, what we will do is we will we will consider another set B. Okay, this A is something which your scheme has. Now consider another set B, which is here. Okay, one second. So this set B we will design this set B. It will have the following properties. B satisfies two things. One is B itself has large probability. Say B has probability greater than one minus delta. Delta is some number. We'll set late. Two. We'll set it later. Second property is something about the probabilities of element in E uh, in B for each x in B. We assume that P of x. Uh, is at most 2 to the power minus lambda. Okay. So this is some other lambda, not this lambda. So 2 to the power minus lambda. This is the same as saying that minus log p of x for each element in b is greater than lambda. So if you can see earlier we had this set a lambda with large probability per bound. Now we are constructing the set b which is very similar. There is a large probability it's a large probability set with uniform lower bound or minus log px. But what is this set got to do with our original set A? Nothing. So how do we bring in B into an analysis? So here is the main observation. Any two large probability sets, the intersection of any two large probability sets is of large probability. So that's what we will use. So if you look at probability of A intersection B, this is at least p of a plus p of b. Okay, actually this is a bound, maybe you don't know this, but you should perhaps remember this bound. I'll derive it quickly. Uh, minus p a union b. Okay, this is equality, but p a, a union b can at most be 1. So this is p a plus p b minus 1. But we assume p a is greater than 1 minus epsilon. We assume p b is greater than 1 minus delta minus 1. So this is exactly minus epsilon plus delta this is this is sort of a this is another union bound we haven't seen union bound yet in this course okay maybe i'll just a small digression here about this union bound so what is union bound here is a vanilla version of union bound probability of two sets let's call them cd c union d is less than equal to probability of c plus probability of d this is one version of union bound. Now, once you have that, you can apply the same bound to the 
complement of a union d which is exactly equal to um, sorry let's just do to the complement of so this is c complement union d complement union bound this is less than equal to probability of c complement plus probability of d complement okay so this this is equal to 1 minus pc plus 1 minus pd and this guy here this set here is c union uh, c intersection d complement right so so this this bound here implies probability 1 minus probability c intersection d is less than equal to 1 minus pc plus 1 minus pd when you rearrange the term you get the same bound pa intersection b is greater than pa plus pb minus 1 so this is exactly the union bound another version of the union bound it's a very handy tool you should remember remember basically it just says that the probability of union of two sets is less than or equal to sum of their probabilities okay so intersection of large probability sets is of large probability so here we are talking about this middle part here between these two sets and this must be of large probability this is one observation also this subset lies inside uh, b and therefore each element has probability at most to the power minus lambda so probability a intersection b so to the so we have a control over probabilities of elements in this set they're all of small probability and they add up to something substantial so their intersection must be of certain cardinality so that's that's roughly the argument how do we formally show it this guy is 2 to the power minus lambda because each element has probability at most at most 2 to the power minus lambda times the cardinality of a intersection b so this bound here and this bound here when you combine them it tells you that cardinality of a intersection b exceeds 2 to the power lambda times 1 minus epsilon minus delta okay that's the same as saying that oh uh, one more thing in fact we we can we were interested in cardinality of a but which is on, which can only be more than the cardinality of a intersection b that itself is this so we have obtained our desired lower bound this is the same as saying log of cardinality of a exceeds lambda minus log 1 by 1 minus epsilon minus delta okay that's the lower bound that we were looking for so this is a result i'll put it down here just call it a theorem for an epsilon between 0 and 1 and lambda greater than 0 let's say for delta between 0 and 1 minus epsilon yeah you wanted 1 plus than 1 minus epsilon so that this term is positive suppose probability under p probability under p of those x for which minus log p x is less uh, is greater than lambda suppose this probability is greater than equal to 1 minus delta then l epsilon x or l epsilon p we have cardinality lower bound for cardinality of any such set a which means there is a such a bound even for the smallest such set a 
so this guy is more than lambda minus log 1 by 1 minus epsilon minus delta okay so all you have to find is this large probability lower bound so the previous result uh, the, the scheme was in terms of large probability upper bound now we the, the lower bound is in terms of large probability lower bound so we already have a candidate for this lambda so that by Chebyshev's inequality lambda equal to so we want a large probability lower bound so lambda equal to expected value of this guy which is just h of p minus a correction term which is the variance of minus log px as usual but this, we only want a delta here so this is greater than this satisfy so this choice satisfies this hash the requirement hash thus so we have a concrete lower bound l epsilon p basically is greater than h of p minus square root 1 by delta um, variance of minus log px minus log 1 by 1 minus epsilon minus delta this bound holds for all epsilon earlier we had a division by when we tried Fano's method we got a division by 1 minus epsilon now there's a loss here and what is this delta this delta can be anything for any delta that is between 0 and 1 minus epsilon so we can set this delta appropriately we can set it to be 1 minus epsilon by 2 so that this term is 1 minus epsilon by 2 and that's the form we use l epsilon p is greater than h p minus um, this guy here minus log 2 by 1 minus epsilon so this is a nice single shot lower bound which looks like the upper bound that we had looks like the h p upper bound remember that what we had shown earlier was that l epsilon p is less than h of p plus square root variance minus log px by epsilon so the two bounds look very similar of course uh, the slack parameter here don't, uh, these slack parameters don't match but what is very interesting is now we can use this bound and compute our limiting result limit n going to infinity 1 by n l epsilon p n the iid case is greater than limit n going to infinity n h p by n minus 1 by n into square root 2 by 1 minus epsilon now this variance becomes variance of sum of iid random variables as we have been seeing and so this is just n times the variance of any one copy minus log p x1 say the first random variable minus 1 by n log 2 by 1 minus epsilon so as lim as n goes to infinity this first term is hp and this goes to 0 and this goes to 0 so this is hp so r epsilon p which is this is more than HP we already saw that it's less than HP so this combining these two things we get R epsilon P not R star but R epsilon P equals to HP for every epsilon between 0 and 1 so that's great okay so we have shown uh, we showed this lower bound this is a single short lower bound any large probability lower bound on minus log px is the lower bound on l epsilon p this lambda any large probability upper bound on minus log px was an upper bound on l epsilon p that's one thing we saw earlier and now what we have established is this strong converse r star epsilon p is hp oh, sorry i forgot that star here okay so this is the first proof uh, Right.
so in fact this proof is uh, i think this is roughly what wolfowitz also has but uh, i took this there's a single shot version here that i presented can, can be found in uh, tesun han's textbook okay uh, he is uh, looking at a slightly more general form but I, all we need in this course is the single shot form okay i wanted to give another proof of the same fact okay and uh, so let me do that now this proof is very recent actually this proof is some is uh, it's my own, uh, it's it's based on my work with my collaborator shun watanabe so here is the second proof it's another proof i think it's conceptually simple simpler okay so uh, how do we show this i'll directly show this result here so sub so consider this x1 to xn iid copies okay uh with common distribution p that's that's the source that you want to encode and how do we encode it we take a mapping f applied to this xn and that's what we store and we assume that suppose this mapping n, uh, f takes values in 0 1 2 3 power l so remember the weak converse based on fano's inequality that we saw we saw that h of f of xn i'm just reviewing that proof quickly here is less than equal to um, L but this guy is greater than equal to maybe careful here so you st you store this f of xn and then there is a decoder which looks at this value the stored value and the probability that probability under p that this decoded value coincides with your original source we know is greater than 1 minus epsilon such a mapping is given to you so how did we show this converse so we have this f of xn and uh, we said that let's do uh, xn comma f of xn and minus h of xn given f of xn that's equality and then we quickly noticed by Fano's inequality that this guy here is because you can recover this with large probability so by Fano's inequality this is at most n epsilon log cardinality of x plus one okay that's how we were showing this proof and then you get this uh, yeah so so this this loss of epsilon log cardinality of x will remain Okay. and how about this guy well f is a function of f is a function of xn so this is exactly equal to n times hx so this guy becomes n times hx minus n epsilon log cardinality of x plus 1 and, and so when you divide by n and take limit you get this hx is lower bound now the problem was that Fano's inequality was weak because it depends on this epsilon. But what if we can restrict our attention to some other distribution under which the error is zero? Then this bound will be very precise actually. Given fxn, you'll be able to recover xn. So can we find such a distribution? And the idea is yes, we can find a very nice distribution like that. Okay, so here is that idea. So we look at this new distribution. So earlier distribution was p, p x n. Now I'm defining this new distribution p tilde x n. This, this, this p tilde x n will be defined in terms of a set. Okay. Let A be the set of those x n for which no error occurs. P of f of Then, sorry, is equal to xn. 
Okay, that's my set A. No error occurs for this set. And Pxn be the conditional distribution, the conditional distribution of Xn given Xn belongs to A. So this is a very complicated distribution, no longer IAD at P tilde Xn. But we can try to write the proof for this new distribution. So once again, even for this new distribution, L, I'm just copying this proof, is greater than H of, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just call this distribution, I'll use tilde here so that I can talk in terms of the random variable. This new random variable is there, which is not ID because it's obtained by conditioning Xn on some event. This is always true because function f has cardinality here. So this is always true. And so we can do the same trick as before. So you will get h of x tilde n minus now h of x tilde n given fx tilde n. But under this new distribution, there is zero error because you are restricted to only those points in which no error occurs. So you have this guy here. And the brilliance here is that, uh, yeah, not so much of a brilliant, but acute observation here is that this is zero. Okay. So, so this part is good. So far, so good. So we don't have this extra term. But now, uh, earlier we had h of x n, which we were able to equate to n times h of x. But now this distribution is not IAD. So how do we get uh, what we wanted? So that's the difficult part here. How do you get uh, how, how do you get this handle over h of x tilde n? Okay. So if we can bound the total variation distance between this x tilde n and x n distribution, then we know how much this entropy changes, right? So for instance, what we know is this guy here is greater than h of x n minus this is the continuity of entropy result total variation distance between p x n p x tilde n log cardinality of x correct by n uh, this is because it's x n minus binary entropy of total variation distance. So I'll just bound by one. So this bound is true. So, so you have n hx minus dp xnp x tilde n log cardinality of x minus 1 by n whole into this n. So if you divide by n and take limit n going to infinity, we, we get a hx. But what happens to this guy? This part is not clear. We don't know if this part goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Okay. In fact, this part can go to 1 as n goes to infinity and therefore that will be a, that will not be a useful result. So let's look at what happens to this part as n goes to infinity. So what happens to this part dpxn px tilde n is less than equal to some constant times actually ln 2 by 2 let me just put the constant ln 2 by 2 the total the, the kullback leibler divergence between xn and px tilde n the important observation here is that uh, 
is that this guy here, the kullback level divergence, is So let's try to evaluate this Kullback liability version. This is summation over x, pn of x log pn of x by p tilde n of x. But p tilde x is just pn of x condition on actually, I should not do this because. use something else. I should use this. So this is summation over x. P x tilde n of x log p tilde x. Of x. So what is p tilde x n of x? Firstly the support is only within a. So you have p tilde uh, p x tilde n of x is p x p x n x divided by probability of a. x n belongs to a. And this is because of the space formula and divided by p x n of x. So this goes away. And so this is just log 1 by probability x n belongs to a. But what was our set a? Our set a was this set where things are correct. So this set has probability greater than 1 minus epsilon. And therefore, log 1 by this is less than equal to log of 1 minus 1 by epsilon. Okay. So, so that's that's the correction term that you get here. Okay. So, what did we get? Uh, what we got is the lower bound that we get is L is greater than n times h of x minus log. log cardinality of x minus 1 by n. okay not 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 good basically because you lose this factor and this looks very large i just wanted hx here right this this factor doesn't go to zero as n goes to infinity so how can we improve this okay so another thing we can try we can try to see what happens if if we try uh, if we try chain rule for x tilde n itself. Okay. So let's try that. Okay. So remember that we, we directly apply continuity argument here, uh, but we could have first expanded this. By the way, this is a slightly sophisticated proof, uh, but uh, I think it is important to see how this Vinsker's inequality and these are, uh, chain rules can lead to very different kind of bound based on how you manipulate them. So this guy, is i equal to 1 to n h of x tilde i given x tilde i minus 1 okay so we just applied chain rule first and now we will use the continuity argument so what does the continuity argument says it says that fine you can replace this with h of x i but you will suffer some correction because of continuity and that's log of cardinality of x. Remember, there's a conditioning here. So um, I'll bring in that conditioning. Maybe I'll write it in a slightly different form. So it is some function. I'll describe what this function is. It's the probability of probability distribution on xi given x tilde i minus 1. So this is a random variable because it depends on x tilde i minus 1. Expected value of x tilde i minus 1. So the, the expectation is over this second part. Where this f of some distribution p on x is uh, the probability that um, This notation is not very good. I have to write the whole detail. Sorry about this. Yeah. Okay. So, so what does the continuity argument give us? 
it gives us it's a total variation distance between probability of x tilde i given x tilde i minus 1 from p x i because there's an expectation over x tilde i minus 1 sitting here this total variation distance log of cardinality of x I'm switching from this distribution to this distribution so I'm conditioning here and writing the correction term plus the binary entropy of total variation distance uh, and therefore this first part is n times hx1 because these are all iid and the extra error term that you get is i equal to 1 to n expected value over x tilde i minus 1 of this total variation distance between p x tilde i given x tilde i minus 1 p x i log cardinality of x plus the binary entropy of the same divergence okay so how large is this term so we know that this is the term we want how large is this term if this term is of smaller order is if it's order root root n then we are done and in fact we can show that so how do we show that we'll use Pinsker's inequality okay so by Pinsker's inequality I can bound this by square root of divergence square root of divergence so this guy here now I'll just focus on the second error term so the second error term here is summation i equal to 1 to n expected value of x tilde i minus 1 square root of kullback leibler divergence between this 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 log of cardinality of x plus h of the same square root yeah there's some constant here this constant is 2 ln 2 by 2 not very important for our proof So I've just used Pinsker's inequality here. All right. Now what do we do? Well, it turns out I can I can divide and multiply with n, and then this will look like some expectation over some random variable. And this function is square root is concave and h of square root is also concave h is concave and then square root is concave so we can take this expectation inside and it will only increase things okay so that's what i'll do i'll just take this expectation inside so when you take this expectation inside what you get is n times square root 1 by n summation i equal to 1 to n expected value of over x tilde i minus 1 this is the first term here divergence between p of x i tilde x tilde i minus 1 given p x i log cardinality of x that's the first term and plus this other term which again you can take expectation inside h of square root c where is this c c by n and then the same summation i equal to 1 to n this term this expected divergence term so what is this sum can you can you see what this sum is by chain rule by chain rule this sum is actually very easy to figure out this sum is exactly equal to the divergence between the joint distribution this is just chain rule of KL divergence. So what we get is this is exactly equal to C by N divergence between P X tilde N P X N. Okay, that's the first term log X. And the second term here is same H of binary entropy of square root C by N the same divergence. And we already saw that this divergence, because px tilde n is just the conditioning of xn, this divergence we saw is just log of 1 by probability that xn belongs to a, which is less than log 1 by 1 minus epsilon. 
So this guy here is less than equal to n times square root c by n into log 1 by 1 minus epsilon plus okay, some another constant log cardinality of x plus h of square root c by n log 1 by 1 minus epsilon. Okay, so this is now the error that you have. Okay, this term here, the n is outside. Uh, so when you divide by n and take limit n going to infinity, you will have limit n going to infinity here. So this error term will go to zero. And so something very magical happened. If you were directly using continuity on this, this thing, a bound actually brings in this extra n, which means the continuity bound was loose. It is better to first expand this using chain rule, then use the continuity argument and then again combine the error terms okay using chain rule again so so i just so this gives you this proof of strong converse it shows that if I to zoom out right so using this bound this bound here what we have shown i'll continue here is that this term is greater than n h of x1 minus uh, something which is of the order square root n, uh, 1 by square root n. So minus 1 by root n log 1 minus this times log cardinality of x minus h of square root c by n log 1 by epsilon, 1 minus epsilon. That's the bound we have obtained. And therefore, as n goes to infinity, so this implies so this is the lower bound for for l so this implies if n goes to infinity then r star epsilon p is greater than limit of hxn minus limit of this guy as n goes to infinity so that's just h of x that's the strong converse statement so this is a very different proof from what we saw earlier and uh, what but these two proofs bring out very different features the first proof that we saw was actually zooming into the problem and trying to figure out uh, how can we act? What is the cardinality of the large probability set? This proof still uses Fano's inequality to do, uh, to, uh, to do that, except that we change the distribution from the original distribution to something else. We change to this very nice uh, distribution, which is no longer IID, but under which a scheme works very well. Any scheme for a given scheme, we came up with this px tilde n. Under this px tilde n, the scheme works very well. The probability of error is zero. Yeah, it's a made up distribution. We just condition on the set where the scheme works. The problem is for this distribution, we don't have a lower bound on joint entropy. But the main observation is that this distribution is not too far from our original distribution. The total KL divergence is the KL divergence, the joint between the joint distribution is at most log 1 by 1 minus epsilon. But then we can leverage this observation and do something. Uh, this, this is something technical, but it's some very interesting thing that uh, sometimes this continuity arguments, it's important where you apply them. Should you apply them to the joint thing or should you apply them to the individual things uh, and get error for each coordinate? In this case, it turns out applying it to for individual thing and then adding the errors is uh, much, much stronger than just applying it to the joint thing, which gave a much weaker bound. In fact, this term need not even be positive. Okay, so we got a very poor bound here. But just by repeating the same argument for each coordinate and then using some tricks this the, basically this is uh, jensen's inequality for convex function uh, uh, for concave functions and then then using chain rule for kl divergence that allowed us to pound this error term the cumulative error term so i suggest that you go over this proof it's a bit technical uh, this is not included in syllabus i just wanted to cover it in this video uh, because it's so, sort of a cutting edge proof uh, and it's good to see these proofs, uh, especially when uh, this is based on our work. So if I'm teaching this course, I should cover these things. All right. Okay. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture. See you in the final lecture of this unit next time. See you next time.